Good morning, everyone. Hello. Welcome to FUMC Prairie Campus. We are glad you're here with us this morning. It's a Epiphany, which you'll find out about as we progress through the morning. And what might seem bizarre has an intent. So let's stand and sing, yes, that's right, We Three Kings, Christmas spills over into Epiphany. Surprise, gotcha. It comes with a purpose, though, which we will find out. So let's sing to begin Epiphany. We Three Kings of Orient are Bearing gifts we traverse afar morning. Lord, thank you for all these precious people, God, these precious souls and precious hearts, complicated stories. Um, God, may we look one another in the eyes this morning and find you there, the holy mystery within each of us, the divine presence, the divine spark within each of us. May we honor one another, learn from one another, and in so doing, we will learn about you, God. Learn who you are, in each other, in this universe, in our lives. May we listen. We ask this in Christ's name, and all of God's people agreed and said amen. 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 Let's run around the room, mix it up, and say, woo, woo, woo. the peace of Christ be with you, and also with, with you. you. Okay, kiddos, children, it is time to release you to Sunday school. I believe Sister Ida is here. She's there. She's Where there. Where are you, Sister? Oh, there right she is. There. She is waving to you, kids. <laughs> See her there. She is waving to you, and she will take you to Sunday school. We want to sing over you as you go, kids. We care about you and your lives. We hope you have a wonderful time at Sunday school. Child, Child of joy, joy, our dearest treasure. treasure. God, you are from God, you came back to God, we humbly give. 
Good morning. God be with you. Happy Epiphany. Now, if, if you're like me and you grew up in a non-liturgical tradition or maybe you didn't grow up in the church at all or um, you may be thinking to yourself, what is Epiphany Sunday? What is she talking about? And why are all these stars? And why do we just think, sing We Three Kings? Like, isn't Christmas over? Like, what was up with that? Um, but Epiphany is part of our church year celebration, part of our church year season. And this is the Sunday once a year when we celebrate the, uh, well, first of all, think of the word Epiphany. You might use that in your everyday language sometimes. It's kind of like this aha moment, like I had an epiphany. It's when something is revealed to you. So um, epiphany means manifestation, revelation, and it's the day that we celebrate when the, the, the magi, when they followed the star, they followed the light that led them to the Christ child. So it's also a time each year when we can kind of um, think about and reflect on, you know, what are, you know, what, what is the light that is leading us, you know, to look for that light in the world and to follow it um, as it hopefully leads us to that divine mystery we call, we call God. So after the service, we are going to enjoy an epiphany cake, um, and we'll have our potluck as well, but you'll have to come and see that. It has gold frankincense and myrrh on it, edible gold frankincense and myrrh on it, so we can look forward to, to that. And I'm going to ex explain later on at communion time this epiphany star prayer station that we'll, that we'll also get to engage with. But again, welcome. I'm so glad that, that each and every one of you are here. I got to meet a number of first-time visitors this morning. We are so glad that you're here. We like to say each week, we especially welcome those of you who are single, married, divorced, widowed, partnered, LGBTQ, straight, black, brown, white, filthy rich, dirt poor, doing okay, or in desperate need of a prayer today. However you walked in here, whatever kind of emotional space you walked in here, you're welcome here, you can belong here, you are wanted here. If you are a first time visitor, I'd love the chance to get to know you better, hear a little bit about your story. If, um, if you are interested in that and connecting, there is a green welcome table over there. It's kind of by Mary over there. Um, and after the service, if you'd like to go over there, we have a free gift for our visitors. And also, if you want to leave your contact information, I'll get in touch with you and, and we'll figure out a time to, to do coffee. But again, we're so glad you're here. At this time, I'd like to welcome and call up our Sunday liturgist. This is one of my favorite parts of the service where each week a different person from the congregation comes on up here and shares um, a scripture verse or some kind of reading that's important to them and then a little bit about why it's important to them. And you know what, Steve, I'm going to let you, why don't you just go ahead and then Steve's going to lead us in the prayers of the people afterwards. Um, but you can go ahead and just be there. So let me introduce um, Susan to you. This is the, the bio that she has shared so we can get to know her a little bit better. She writes, I am a native of Colorado Springs. I began my spiritual journey at FUMC downtown where my grandfather was the adult Sunday school teacher. And somehow I ended up there in that Sunday school class with him on Sundays. I love that, a little kid in the adult Sunday school class. I've spent most of my life here in the Springs, but six years also in San Diego, where I attended college and met my late husband. We came here every year for Christmas for our first three years of marriage, and he loved it because of the snow. So we moved here and were married 30 years until his unexpected going home in 2012. We have a son and daughter who both live here in the Springs with their spouses. Our son has five daughters, and our daughter and her husband have two dogs, two cats, and I live with them here in Banning Lewis. I enjoy reading, especially the Bible, gardening, swimming, photography, helping others, and as of late, 
being helped by others. So let's, um, let's welcome Susan. Good morning, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, well, I never do this, so I'm a little bit nervous, but I felt like I should, should share the scripture that, that is on my heart is, is the one from John um, that's on a lot of people's shirts. Liz, and show us your shirt. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Love each other. So Jesus put it this way, a new commandment I give you, that you love each other as I have loved you. And I think the reason he said a new commandment, though we all know that's an old commandment given in the Old Testament, love God and love others as you love yourself, but it, it was new because Jesus was going to the cross to die for us, for all sins, for all people. And I was walking to the pool one day, I was going to go swimming, and uh, as I said, I love photography, so I saw the sign and it said, love each other. And I was like, ah, I need to get a picture of that. <laughs> so I went over and took a picture of it. And then on the back side, it said church at 10 o'clock. <laughs> so I went ahead and, and went swimming. And uh, the next week I came and I just have come to love this little branch on the prairie. I love its all-inclusiveness because I believe that is Jesus' heart. He wanted everyone to come. And it's just a sweet, a sweet little place to be. And I had three years of just sort of being away from the world for a number of reasons, but nevertheless, what happened was I just could watch the world and see what we really need is love. That really is the answer. God obviously knows what he's doing, and he's also given us the great privilege of being able to pray to him. And it, it's amazing to me that the creator of the universe would invite us to come in and pray and talk to him about the things that concern us. So anyway, that's the scripture. And if you would pray with me now, I just pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Susan. And as, as Steve comes forward to, to lead us in the prayers of the people, I just, um, I'm just so touched by that story about how she walked by a sign and um, I know right now Randy Stubbins is our one who puts out those signs every Sunday over here. And, and again, just doing something simple like that, how that has impacted somebody's life. So I thank, I thank you so much. I thank the wheelers who, who did the signs for years. So, and now let us um, open our hearts in prayer. Live and loving God, thank you for your presence here today. Remind us in this special time to open our hearts, open our minds, to open our lives to you and your indwelling spirit. God, in your mercy. And now please join me in the prayer of confession as printed on the slide, let us pray together. 
Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. We have done things we should not have done, and we have neglected to do those things we should have done. Forgive us and turn us around, we pray. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, God, for this incredible universe you have created for us, filled with mystery and wonder. Let us find fulfillment, purpose, and meaning in the midst of this ever-changing world. God, in your mercy. God, we know you hear our cries of confusion. You understand our desire to relieve the suffering of those in our world threatened by war, disease, famine, loneliness, addiction, homelessness, abandonment, prejudice, and discrimination. Send us out with loving hands to do your sacred work and send your loving spirit to soothe those beyond our reach. God, in your mercy. And now hear each one of us as we pray in the silence of our hearts. God, in your mercy. And let all God's people say amen. amen. Thank you. Friends, uh, there's lots going on in the life of the church, so I'd encourage you to take your bulletin home and at your leisure look through it and, and see if you can find ways to, to grow and to serve and, and, and to connect with your church family. Uh, there's a, a few things that I want to highlight, um, but before I, well, actually, I'll, I'll wait and do that. I'm going to, okay. I'm just going to remind you that there is a church potluck afterwards. If you did not bring anything, Wonderful, because I brought a ton of mac and cheese, and I don't want to go home with it, so please come and eat my mac and cheese, um, and just enjoy a time of fellowship. Try to, try to make a new friend, see somebody you don't know, and introduce yourself. I know it's very scary for all the introverts out there, but let's, let's continue to build community with one another. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite Reverend Kim Hockman to come on up, and she is going to share... Uh, an announcement with us about something called a walk to Emmaus, which is a, an incredible spiritual growth opportunity that is being offered to us. So welcome, Kim. Come on up. Good morning. How are you? Um, how many of you have gone on walk to Emmaus? Okay, so some of you have already been there, but I want to tell you a little bit about what it is. It's something that's really changed my life long time ago. It's an intern, this is the official part, it's an international program primarily intended to spiritually ground church leaders. Okay, so we're trying to develop church leadership. Um, it's a three-day experience. You might call it a retreat, but it's a little bit more work than a retreat, <laughs> I think. It's done the same way wherever it's done, anywhere in the world, and it is global, as I mentioned. You'll go on a Thursday night and return on a Sunday afternoon. You'll listen to 15 talks. It sounds awful, but it's really good. Um, most of them are given by laypersons, but five of them are given by clergy. It's sort of a short course in Christianity, um, but the kind of Christianity that we want to practice, the kind that really emphasizes what it means to live a life in the grace of God. You only do a walk to Emmaus once, and uh, you have to be sponsored by somebody to go. And I know that sounds kind of cultish, but it's really not. It's, um, it's not for everybody. It's not the kind of retreat you're going to send somebody on to go find Christ. 
Um, it, it, it assumes that you already have some kind of a relationship with Christ. It could be anything from brand new Christian to clergy. Um, not that some clergy aren't. Yeah, but anyway, um, it, you can be anywhere in your spiritual walk, and it's really, really a, a time of growth for you. Um, but you have to be sponsored just to make sure you're not in the middle of a crisis or something like that, that it's a good time for you to go and, and uh, receive what you'll experience. Um, I went on my walk in 2000, which is so long ago now, um, and it really changed my life. That was a, a year of change for me. That's the year I became sober, too, so it was kind of crazy. But um, I really... It changed my life, and I really wanted my husband to go at the time, but he is, you talk about introverts, he is like the ultimate introvert. You haven't seen him here except on special occasions. He's like total introvert, and he wouldn't go. And I couldn't really blame him, but I really wanted him to go. And this, I, I eventually said, I just want you to know how much God loves you, and I don't think you know that. And he said, okay, I'll go like, what? Okay. So in 2016, he went, and I still remember his description of his experience. He said, and if you know my husband, this is so typical, they metered out the information in just the right pace so that we could really understand God's grace. And I want this for everybody. So Emmaus of the Rockies has a women's walk coming up March 14th to the 17th at Camp Elam in Woodland Park, and a men's walk um, April 18th to the 21st at John Wesley Ranch in Divide. And I have to say, I actually called them because this male and female, husband and wife, go separately. I was like, okay, so what about LGBTQ community? Are you welcoming? And they assured me yes. And in my experience, it is um, a very welcoming community to anybody who goes. So. Um, so yeah, so if you'd like to talk more about it, or if you'd like to consider jump-starting your spiritual journey, talk to anybody who's been on a walk to Emmaus. Myself or Cam Scott have kind of officially offered to, to be the go talk to people. But again, everybody that's been, raise your hand. Okay, so you can talk to any of these people to hear what it's about and see if maybe it's, it's about if it's something that you wanna do. So thank you. Thank you, Kim. So friends, I am I'm super um, delighted today to introduce our guest preacher to you. She's, she's not a stranger to many of you as she's been part of our community for a while now. Um, Pastor Kathy Eskew is um, going to preach today and I would love to read you her bio. Her bio is also in the bulletin if, if, if you want to uh, follow along with that. Kathy writes, I'm happily married to Bruce who is a CPA and we have raised three kids who returned to Colorado Springs after being gone for 10 years each. We also have four terrific grandkids. I was a math major, a fact which most people don't believe if they know me. And I, as I pursued messily my call in life, I landed with an MA in youth ministry and an MDiv in theology from Fuller Seminary. Most of my training is from the School of Hard Knocks, including a year in Haiti, five years with Compassion International, and 40 years serving Covenant Presbyterian Church in numerous capacities, including Associate Pastor of Prayer and Healing Ministry. Um, it's been a joy to have Kathy active here at the Prairie Campus. She's been especially active in our Adult Spiritual Formation Committee um, and is part of that wonderful group that, that brings small groups and, and the Adult Sunday School to our congregation. So after we sing this next song, we're going to uh, welcome Kathy up here and, and open ourselves to hearing a word from God from her. So now let us stand and continue worshiping in song. I love singing this song every new year. I thought it would be a pity if we didn't sing this at the top of 2024. Be thou my vision.
Thank you. You may be seated. That is one of my favorites, and I'm so glad that we sang that. It's a great worship song. Would you please join me in the Word of God, starting in Matthew 2, 1 through 12, and then we'll move into Colossians 1, 26, 27. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the Christ child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star in the east and have come to pay him homage. And when King Herod heard this, he was frightened in all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is shepherd, who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. And when they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen in the east, until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the, the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Colossians 1, 26, 27 reads, the mystery has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The word of God for the people of God. As the bulletin said, I have four grandchildren, all under the age of six. And over the course of this last month, I can't tell you how many games of hide-and-seek we played. And the version that they like to play is different than the one I'm used to playing. My goal is to never be found, to find the most remote place in the world, in the house or in the yard, and to be the last one found. 
Well, theirs is just the opposite. For them, they want to be found now or yesterday or hurry up, you know, and find me now. And so in order to do that, they hide in the same place over and over again. And one of the places they love to hide is the bathtub where they can hide behind the curtain. So I count to 10, you know, I walk upstairs, I know exactly where they are, but in case I don't know, I hear this, Gigi, Gigi, where are you? And so I pretend like I'm following something, you know, and I go into the bathroom and I throw open the curtain and I say, there you are. And they say, oh, you found me. And then we have this little happy dance and then we start all over and we do it again and they hide in the same place <laughs> over and over again. I bring all this up because I think we have a God who is an awful lot like my grandchildren. He wants to be found. He wants us to know where he is. And if we're really honest, there's a lot of times we see him. We see him in a sunset. We see him in the sunrise. We see him when we hold a newborn baby and we go, oh my gosh, there's something eternal about this picture. And then there are times when God seems more than elusive, right? Maybe you're, you come to the fellowship on Sunday morning and you feel connected and loved and you get this warm feeling. You go home and by dinner time, you feel unconnected with everything. The feeling's gone. Maybe you are going through a time of hardship when, when your health is, is declining and you can't get on top of it, or you're underemployed and you can't seem to get your foothold. Maybe you're in a relationship that seems to be breaking up or at least broken someplace and you're not sure where God is in all of it. The story that we're looking at this morning is the story of the Magi, and it's about men who are seeking. They are the seekers in the story, and it's about how God reveals his coming to them and to the world. It's my prayer this morning that this story will somehow lead us like the star to knowing where God is. And I know that's a tall order for 20 minutes. <laughs> but if nothing else, what I really hope that we hear is that God wants to be found, and that is his heart. And sometimes that's enough. You know, sometimes that's enough. So who are these magi anyway? And, you know, the scripture just gives us one verse, one sentence about who he is. So we have to look into the history of it, what we know about Persia and Babylon and who the Magi were coming from that area. And what I learned is that they were uh, a religious caste system, that they were born into that caste system and that's where they grew up, that's where they were educated. They were masters of astrology and demonology and divine incantation. There in Persia and in Babylon, there were centers of learning because the Jews had gone to settle there in the exile. So they had set up centers of learning where Gentiles or people who were non-Jewish could go and learn all sorts of things. And one of the things that they believed uh, happened in those learning centers is that Hebrew prophecy was also shared and learned. So here we have the this religious caste system, these magi who have grown up around the prophecies, they're not part of the faith by any stretch of the imagination, and they view a star, and something draws them into that star's orbit, no pun intended. There's something that gets them out of their comfort zone, and you know, that, that was hard for me this morning because that bed that I was in was pretty warm, and I knew I had to get dressed and get up and get out. So, you know, it's hard to get out of our comfort zone, but they did. And not only that, but they had 900 miles to travel. That's like from Prairie Campus to Manitoba Camp, uh, 
Canada. That's a heck of a long way. And it took them months to get there. They took trade routes and they probably ran into all sorts of wonderful ideas that they wanted to stop and listen to. They ran into new marketable goods that they had never seen before. I mean, think of the distractions. If I were a Magi and I was on that route, I don't know how far down the road I would get. But they got 900 miles. So they get to Jerusalem and they ask a simple question. Where do I find the newborn king of the Jews? It's like going into Pueblo and said, where's the nearest, well, it's not quite like this, but where's the nearest Walgreens? I mean, they're asking directions. Where would I find this child? But instead of it being a simple question about directions, the whole city erupts. The whole city gets agitated and troubled. Something has just disturbed their peace of mind and and what they anticipate and what are they going to do with the fact that these strangers are coming in asking about a newborn king of the Jews. Herod enters the picture, and through history, we know him to be a usurper of his position. He is neither Roman, nor is he Israeli. He has no power base among either side. He got his position by manipulation and by going to Rome and talking himself into the courts, into the right places where things were decided, and he got this position given to him as ruler of Judea. So he was constantly worried about about armies coming in from the east, which is where the Magi came from. He had domestic problems. He had ten wives and lots of children with that. And they all wanted a place and a piece of his authority and his power. So you know what he did? He imprisoned them. I mean, what else are you going to do with your ten wives and your children? (laughs) He threw them into prison, and he began to execute them at will. It's been told that Caesar Augustus said that he'd rather be a pig in Herod's court than one of his sons. So that tells you a little bit about his reputation. And all this is going to be important if you can hang on. So the Magi were drawn into the web of Herod's uh, intrigue and um, subterfuge. They leave his courts and they go and the star reappears. It's as though the star had disappeared for a season and now it reappears and it appears over the home of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And so here they come down the path, up the up the. Bethlehem cobblestones where it's windy and you know they're making a big ruckus because they have they have um, animals they have themselves they have their attendants they probably have guards to protect them from thieves along the road they are an entourage and it's just like we might listen for a fire engine coming up our neighborhood road so they could hear these people, this entourage coming up. And I imagine everybody looking out the window, kind of going, oh my gosh, what's going on here? And and then they do the most horrifying thing, which is to stop at your house, which is what they did with Mary. They stopped at her house of all places. And I don't know what Mary was thinking, but if if I were her, I'd be saying, first, Lord, I give birth miraculously to this baby. Then shepherds show up. And now this... What does all this mean? Now, that's just a little sidebar, what I think Mary thought. So the Magi, it says, find the child with exceeding great joy. And what I picture this like is like my grandkids in the bathtub. The curtain flies open, and they go, you found me. And the, and the wise men go, oh, there you are. Of course, Jesus is only two or under. But, but the sentiment is there. It's that kind of joy, that kind of little happy dance that, that, that you do. So the Magi give their gifts, and they fall on their knees, and they give homage. 
Now, this is where we quickly move over into other stories and things, because we think that's the end of what's going on. But I want us to pause for a second to think about this. These, the Magi, from that root word, we get magician. Okay? So these were experts in demonology and incantation. They worshipped the stars, the moon, the sun. They worshipped everything that Yahweh had said, do not touch. Do not go there. For 2,000 years, Yahweh had tried to shape this nation, the nation of Israel, into a people after his own heart. These were not good little Gentile men who came. They were excluded because of their worship, because of their idolatry. They were excluded by their pedigree, by education, by their politics. Everything in the Hebrew nation would say, you are unclean. You are heathen. You are pagan. You have no place in this story. And what does God do? He says, we're going to get rid of that boundary. We're going to get rid of that exclusion. That's not happening anymore. And he calls them the least likely to come and play the prominent role in his story. Not Herod's story. Not the Magi's story, but God's story. He broke the exclusion and said, you matter. And you belong. So back to finding God. Maybe we're looking for God in the wrong places. I mean, that could be right. The passage contrasts two locations. One is Herod's court. The other is the home of Jesus. And I think the Magi were looking in the courts and at the home, right? So we have two different milieus. We have Herod's court, which is full of courtiers, guards, armies, minstrels, anything that Herod wanted because his was a climate of fear and domination. Why? I think it's because in his core, he knew he was illegitimate and he had things to defend. And his position and his right to do things was part of that. And Jesus, on the other hand, his main attendant was his mom. He had no guards. He had no courtiers. He had no minstrels. He had no banners. There were no fireworks, you know. There were no balconies at which you, you walk, walk the royalty out to the balcony and all the masses scream and holler, yay, there's a new baby in the royal courts. There's nothing like that. Why? Because he is the legitimate king. See, he doesn't have to defend. He doesn't have to do anything about his position or his identity because he's the real thing. So he doesn't need armies. He doesn't need a court. He doesn't need minstrels. He doesn't need a trust fund. He doesn't need any of the things that we associate with those kinds of courts of power. He is free to be who he is, and he leads a life as an adult in a profound relationship with God the Father, living out his freedom to help, to reconcile, to heal, to teach, to restore, all these beautiful things that the kingdom is about. And before we move too far away, I, what I want to say to us about this is that you are legitimate children of God. Why? Because this is God's plan. This is not man's plan. You are legitimate children of God, and you can live into that identity. You do not have to defend it. You do not have to protect it. It's made in God's plan because God himself has willed it so. Humanity has nothing to do with that plan other than going along with it. So what that does is that frees us up, right? It frees us up to go and be and do who we are and who we're called to be. That's good news. That's freedom. Okay, so 
Do you think we can go back to finding God? I think we can. Here are a few places that I think this story leads us into where we can find God. We can find him in inconspicuous places of power, in common places, in your home, in my home. We can find Christ where people are included and not excluded, where people are reconciled and not divided, restored and not torn down, where people are sacrificing for one another and not self-serving. There's one other place I want to bring up. During Advent, beginning of December, I want you to know I listened to Pastor Patty. This is what I did. She said from here, she said, let it slow. So I thought, I love that. I'm going to go do that. So I went home and I learned to breathe. Breathe in, breathe out. Slow down, breathe in, breathe out. I enjoyed my tree. I enjoyed the lights in the, um, in the neighborhood. I bought presents for my grandkids off of Amazon. I uh, went out to lunch and coffee with friends and celebrated that way. And about the third week, though, I felt my spirit changing. And I know some of you in this room know exactly what I'm talking about, and others of you may not. And if you don't, that's okay, because it's not key to the whole story. But my spirit started to sink, even after doing all those things. I lived with it for about three or four days. And then I thought, i got to do something. I've been here before. I've been, I've, it felt like I had a piano on my chest. Have you ever had a piano on your chest? That's how it felt. So I did what was not intuitive. I, call, I, I contacted two friends, because you want to isolate when you get like that. But I contacted two friends, texted them what I was doing. Please pray. I don't know what's going on. Well, I heard from them, of course, and one of them said, you know, Kathy, I think we underestimate the stress of the holidays. I thought, yeah, that's really true. We do. The second friend said, you know, Kathy, I know you pretty well. And two years ago, you lost your brother unexpectedly from a botched surgery. And I think you're grieving. And I think you should be kind to yourself. So I took those two things to heart, and I began to change my direction in terms of where I spent my time. And I began to just kind of live into the, the grief and the lament and the loss of losing my brother. And my spirit began to change. It took a little while. It took a few more days. But my spirit began to lift. And the point of this story is I want you to ask the question, where did Kathy find Christ that season? I want you to know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I found Christ in those two friends. Because they knew me. They loved me. They took time to talk to me. And they knew God. And that's what really Colossians is all about, that there's another mystery that God wants to pull back that bathroom shower curtain again and say there's another mystery, and the mystery is that Christ is in you. Is that not great news? Martin Luther King says, we are little Christs. And if you'll just indulge me this one kind of long quote, it's not too long. But if you'll just indulge me a little bit. Martin Luther wrote this. He said, as our Heavenly Father has in Christ freely come to our aid, we also ought freely to help our neighbor through our body and its works. And each one should become, as it were, a Christ to the other, that we may be Christ to one another, and Christ may be the same in all. Surely we are named after Christ, he writes, not because he's absent from us, but because he dwells in us, that is because we believe in him and we are Christ's to one to another and do to our neighbors as Christ does to us. But in our day, we are taught by the doctrine of men to seek nothing but merits, rewards, and the things that are ours. Of Christ, we have made only a taskmaster, 
far harsher than Moses. Luther reminds us that where we look matters and what we look for matters. I'll end with a 30-second description of a dream that I had. And this was 20 years ago? I don't know. I had a dream that has stuck with me. I was in a dark place, a dark room, and there were walls that I could feel with my hands. I couldn't see a thing, but there were, there were walls, and I was up against the wall, and I was trying to find a way out, thinking, I got in here somehow. There's got to be a way out, but there was no doorknob, there's no window, there's no nothing. And as the light began to come into that room, kind of like an epiphany, I saw in the middle of this room the way out. It was a staircase le just leading from the center of the room from the floor up to the top where there was light. I had been groping around in the dark when the, when the exit was right in the middle of it. So what I want to share in closing is that Christ is right in our midst. We don't have to travel 900 miles to Manitoba, Canada. He's sitting next to you. He's in the, next, he's in the person next to you and across the way. He's in our culture where all those things that I mentioned can be found. And I hope that this year in 2024, we can throw back the curtain and say, oh, there you are. And God will say back, oh, you found me. Good job. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And we ask that you would let it root itself in our souls. Sift my words, Lord, so that only yours remain. And may we be your people, for you are our God. In your name, amen. Thanks, Kathy. Well, it's time to take our offering now. So ushers, if you would come forward. We, we pass the plates in kind of the old school manner, but also we um, have some instructions here on how to give electronically. Um, this room is full of steel and concrete, so you have terrible <laughs> signal in here. So maybe snap a picture of that if you need to, and you could give when you have reception. Um, there's also a tiny little wooden box if you'd want to drop something in there. Uh, but more than anything, we just want to say every week, we are so grateful for the generosity of everyone here, giving from their hearts to keep this community going. We're so grateful for all of you. Thank you. Every nation sees the glory of a star that pierced the night as we tell the wondrous story. We are bathed in radiant light, stars sent forth from highest heaven, dancing light of God's design. Shine upon the gift that's given, word made flesh now born in time. Every tongue shall sing the praises of his birth in deepest night. He is healing for the ages. He is Christ of God's delight. Dismay. Gather, gather.
guards the world together in the brightness of your day. Fill our hearts with joy forever. Help us walk the holy way. May your justice rule the nations. May your people live as one. Now we see our true salvation in the glory of your Son. I've shared this story before, but whenever we go to North Carolina to visit my mother-in-law and it's time for us to leave, we cannot leave her house without her showering us with all sorts of food. You know, she'll make us the turkey sandwiches and she'll give us the little Doritos and she'll cut an apple and, you know, um, our, our backpacks as we get on the airplane are, are full of this, of this food, this, this bread for the journey, this sustenance for the journey. And here, as we have started 2024, and as we begin our epiphany journey, as we follow the light, as we look for the light, as it leads us to God, God sends us with, with bread and cup. This is God's table where God feeds you with love. More than anything here, God is feeding you with love. We remember that on that last night, Jesus gathered with his friends as he gathers here with his friends today. He took the bread, he gave thanks for it, and he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant. This is the cup of forgiveness and new life. Whenever you drink this, remember me. And so we remember him who always remembers us. Together, let's bless this bread and this cup. Holy mystery, God the Spirit, we call on you to transform these familiar things as you continually transform the world around us. Bless this bread and this cup, the wheat and the grape, the farmer and the harvest, so that in the sharing of these simple elements, we may taste and see your goodness and catch a glimpse of what it is to be in communion with you and with one another. Amen. In just a moment, you're going to be invited to come up. Ushers won't release you. You can just come forward as the Spirit leads you. If you desire gluten-free elements, those will be over at that side black table where, where Dave Meeks is. Um, if you desire prayers today for um, anything going on in your life or in the life of the world, um, Steve Earnshaw and I would be so honored to, to pray with you. Steve doesn't know. I just volunteered him that. Um, Steve will be over here and I'll be here. And again, we would be deeply honored to pray with you about... Oh, Steve is up there. Kathy! Kathy, I'm volunteering you um, to be over there. Kathy would be so honored to pray with you. Yes. Um, but then also, um, as you come forward uh, for communion and, and for prayers, I want to invite you to visit our Epiphany table over here. Um, on this table, there are star words, not star wars, but star words. And uh, this is a prayer practice uh, that, that churches celebrate all over the world on Epiphany. We celebrated last year for the first time. And as you come forward, you pick up a star. Now you can't see the word on it because they're all upside down. I just picked up this one, it says choice. So this is gonna be my word for the year. And um, with this prayer practice, you're invited to put your star word somewhere where maybe you'll see it every day. I, mine from last year, I put it on my bathroom mirror. Some people put it in their cars, you know, all over in your purse. Um, and then just be open to how God might be speaking to you through your star word this coming year. And maybe when you first pick it up, you're like, oh, I don't like that. And you're tempted to put it down and pick up another one. 
If you do, it's okay. But I would, I would ask you to just, just trust. You may not like it. It may not speak to you at all. But just kind of be open to how God may work through this, uh, through this little prayer practice in the coming year. And maybe at the end of the year, you'll look back. I'll look back and I'll know, hmm, God was speaking to me through this word called choice. So again, after, after receiving communion, you're invited to come forward and, and take a star to journey with in the coming year. Come, for all things are ready.
Friends, let us join together in our prayer of thanksgiving. Or maybe, maybe I'll, I'll pray it. <laughs> let us pray. Gracious God, at this table you have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. We thank you for your love for us. Love that reaches out to accept us wherever we are, whoever we are. Love that demands a lot, but at the same time, somehow, amazingly enables us to meet those demands. Help us to risk showing that same love to others. Amen. Friends, as we uh, prepare to go and enjoy our potluck together, I'd invite those of you who are physically able to, to put your chair up on the rack before you leave. That is, that is such a, a help to us. Um, and again, please, if this is your first Sunday, um, please come. Come whether you brought something or not, and uh, let's enjoy our Epiphany cake and Epiphany celebration together. Now let us stand for our benediction. Our benediction um, is from St. Teresa of Avila, and I'd invite us to say it together. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. So go be that body of love and know that the love and grace of God is with you now and always. Amen.